We're back again for another episode of Startup Therapy from Startups.com. I'm Ryan Rutan, joined as always by my partner, Will Schroeder, CEO, Startups.com. Today, we're going to do something a little different. Um, you know, there's there's often a, a, a little bit of education to what we're doing today. This is really going to be about storytelling. Um, we often talk about issues that that affect us as founders on this as the kind of the point of startup therapy. Um, today we're going to, we're really going to turn the lens back on ourselves. Um, and Will and I are going to share some stories about some things that we've gone through personally. Um, things that most founders will go through at some point, right? There, there's a lot of we struggle involved bad. in this game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and sadly, you know, for as bad as both these things were, I know people who've been through even worse. Yeah. There's um, but it's it's the kind of thing where you know it it definitely does have an impact when you're going through it yourself. Uh, you may often feel isolated and alone. Uh, the reality is you're probably not. This is something that that most of us will face at some point. So what we're talking about today is how you know the startup can be going fine, it can be growing well and doing all the right things. It can be very healthy, and you as the founder, uh, quite to the contrary. Uh, can be exactly the opposite, right? Your health yeah, can I, can really suffer. How to deal with that? How to deal with what yeah. can sometimes be a career-ending health issue or life circumstance, especially as it relates to a startup, because you're in command of all that. All that responsibility sits on you. If you work at a company and you're an employee, not that that's not important, but you know they'll replace you and and the company will be okay. When you are the company, <laughs> a little different, <laughs> a little bit different. Um, and so I think today, Ryan, I think if we dig into a couple of stories, because let's face it, over the last, I mean, this we're talking a few years ago, you yeah. and I both separately went through essentially what, what would have, what would have, could have been career ending health issues, uh, significant. And Absolutely. we want to talk through what we went through, what was going through our head at the time, because <laughs> it wasn't very positive, uh, and how we dealt with it. And, and again, I think if nothing else, for some of the folks that are out there that are listening, that are either dealing with this or kind of wondering what if, this is the story about what happens when the what if comes. So Absolutely. With, with that said, Ryan, I'd love for you to share your story because sure. it, was, it was a long arc coming. I remember specifically how the whole thing went down uh, and I'd love to hear more about it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so for me, um, it, it started back in my, in my twenties. And if I, if I really dig back, there are probably signs showing, um, even earlier than that, but uh, really kind of started to hit ahead. And I was diagnosed, uh, in my twenties as having psoriasis and, you know, psoriasis is an interesting challenge in that, um, there are psychological impacts. There are obviously physical impacts, emotional impacts. Um, and I have fairly thick skin and that is not a psoriasis joke. Um, <laughs> but I have fairly thick skin. And so I wasn't terribly bothered by, by a lot of the, the early symptoms, you know, uh, you know, patchy skin, you know, itchy stuff showing up here and there. Um, but the thing that bothered me from the very beginning was, and it happened like right as the diagnosis. And in fact, I think he delivered it before the diagnosis. I think he said, like, I want you to know there's no cure for this but there's treatment. I'm like, okay, we're starting off on a really great foot here, doc. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Right. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. Where shall I deposit all of my hope? Should I just leave it right, over right. here? Um, and, but there, there are treatments, right? And so per conventional medicine, there's, there's no cure for psoriasis. And so I mentally had to kind of check myself there and say like, okay, I'm going to be dealing with this forever. And then the second statement was, there are treatments, there are, there are things to do to mitigate the symptoms, but it will continuously get worse as you get older. I'm thinking what's like, the worst it could get? It can get uh, pretty severe. So there's two aspects of, of psoriasis that you end up dealing with uh, in, in terms of symptoms. One is the, is the skin issue, right? Where you get this really heavy, thick, scaling, flaky skin, and it can appear anywhere on the body. Um, and it can, you know, it can come and go. Um, but you know, I've seen, I've seen cases where people have 70 to 80% body coverage, right? Meaning that I, 70 to I 80% remember, of the surface of their skin. I remember at one point you were saying you were literally bleeding across your back at night. So that was one of the, the really exciting, uh, symptoms was that I had this huge patch on my back and it would get really, really dry. And you know, like you, you do the, the wake up and stretch at night or like you just you know, bend or change positions a little bit. Sure. The skin across my back was so dry and so tight that when I would do that, it would just split. 
Ugh. And then I would lay there and I would just uh, wait. Uh, and then I would feel the blood running down my back uh, onto the sheets. Uh, and I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's brutal, right? It's just, it's, you know, and uh, like, is it the worst thing that could be happening to me? No. But like dealing with this kind of stuff on a daily basis was just, it just wore me down, wore me out. So I started digging into all the options, systemic steroids that you take, you know, that go throughout your entire body. So you're, you're impacting all of your organs, uh, your, your, your limb system, your, your uh, circulatory, everything starts to get impacted by these, these systemic steroids. And they weren't helping much. And so I stopped taking those, went to topical. So I'm smearing myself in creams and salves and lotions and liquids. Um, and they do have an effect. Um, they'll also cause you to thin skin um, over time. Uh, they, can, they can lead to uh, bone density loss um, hair loss, all sorts of really fun stuff. And my scalp was one of the areas where I had it the worst and I would just scratch the hell out of myself. Right. Which Ugh. socially not awesome. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You're the yeah. guy who stands at the corner, like <laughs> constantly, you know, fanning the, the dandruff off his shoulders because he's, he's scratching the hell out of his scalp. Not awesome. Um, so I decided none of this was really working very well for me. And so then you start to go down the rabbit hole right? And there's no shortage of information out there for any, any, any health condition, right? So I go down the rabbit hole. I'm looking for gurus and experts and um, alternate therapies. I was doing juice fasts and diets, starving myself, taking supplements, um, you know, sunbathing, saltwater bathing, all these different things, some pharmaceuticals as well. Um, and I was able to keep it under control, right? And this is in my late 20s to like really early 30s. Right. Now, here's something else about psoriasis. Stress is a major contributor to the flare-ups, right? It's not a cause of psoriasis, but if you already have it, sure. um, if you get stressed, it dials it from, you know, a 5 or a 6 to a 15. Real quick. And um, so get involved in a startup is what you should do. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so here, here was my trajectory. Here's how I decided to test this theory of stress yeah. and psoriasis. I'm going to add all startups. The startups are kind of uh, are kind of stressful, right? Having your first child can be a little stressful. International moves are kind of stressful, and within a 12 month period, my wife and I did all of those things. And so, yeah. Uh, it got a little worse. It got a little worse during that period. Um, and then the other thing, and the other side of, of psoriasis, the is not the skin issue, is the the general inflammatory con condition within the joints. We'll call it psoriatic arthritis. And this is where it really, really started to mess with me. Um, I'd been... And how, how old are you at the time? Again, like I really realized that it was psoriatic arthritis in my early 30s, but I'd been having joint pain and joint issues for years before that, right? It started to slow down some of my sport activities, uh, swimming, soccer, volleyball, uh, surfing, a lot of things that I had done when I was younger um, became more difficult. And I was just kind of like chalking it up to aging, right? Well, it turned out that my joints and my body were aging a lot faster than they should have been because of all this. I was just a, basically a big bag of inflammation. And then I think that, you know, the stress is really what then kicked that off and made it so obvious that this wasn't physical activity. Before that, I thought like, oh, I will do something physical and then I'll get some inflammation in the joints. They'll hurt. They'll, they'll, you know, I'll get some ligament pain, some joint pain, some, some tendon pain, but then it'll, it'll ease off and I'll feel better. Um, and then I realized this was happening and I was doing nothing physical, right? Nothing, nothing physically stressful, right? We were running the startup. You know, we'd started startups.com. Um, I was dealing with baby. We had done the international move. I was still trying to figure out life back in the U S now for the first time in, in, in half a decade for me. And, uh, it just got worse and worse and worse. And it got to the point where like they weren't getting better. Right. I had gotten used to this sort of ebb and flow of this joint pain and it just stayed. Right. And it really hit ahead at that point chronic pain somewhere. Like sometimes it go from like left knee to right knee or maybe how bad both my talking? shoulders, but not my back. Um, to the point where like, you remember, you remember me hobbling around the office, like the ghost of startups past, right? I was, I was a really shell. Bad. You were like an 80 year old man. I, I felt like an 80 year old man. I mean, I, I was, it was things like I couldn't sit through a meeting on the couch in our conference room. I remember that without like, I'd have to shift positions constantly. I'd be moving around. People are asking like, are you okay? Right. Like, or it looked like I just had to take a leak all the time. Like I was just <laughs> constantly kind of moving a little bit to try to take pressure off whatever joint was hurting the most. Um, it really hit ahead when, when a couple things happened, our second daughter, Aria was born and 
that in and of itself, you know, another, another kind of, you know, semi-stressful experience, um, having a newborn, going back to not sleeping and all that stuff. When she started crawling and not even crawling and she's like, like, do the roll over on the floor thing. I realized I could not get up and down off the floor at 36 years old to be with my daughter. And, or I would decide not to, I'd see her on the floor and she'd be doing Uh, something cute and I'd want to get on a plane. I'd be like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to watch it from up here because I know if I get down, it's going to be like a good, this 90 second process of, of reestablishing vertical posture that just hurts like hell. And so it really started to have impacts on daily life. And so at this point, you know, you're sitting down with your wife and what's that conversation look like? Yeah. It, yeah. It doesn't look good. Right. And, and she's, she's stressed and she's worried about it and she's done like over the top type stuff to try to help me with this to, to the extent where she went and found a, a full protocol, uh, involving diet and, and a bunch of other therapies, um, some of which are not very pleasant at all. And she was working hard to help me fix this problem. And it was taking a toll on her. I mean, she was preparing separate meals for me and then for herself and her older daughter. And then she was homemaking, you know, the baby food for, our, for our, the, the little one. And so she's doing like three different meal prep three times a day. And it, keep it getting was worse. huge. It keeps getting worse. We found some things that would make it a little bit better for a period of time. Um, and, and then it would come back. So like every time we get a little bit of hope, like, ah, this is, I'm feeling a little bit better. I'm able to sleep a little bit better. That was the other thing, man, sleeping through the night between the, I might just wake up bleeding and, um, I'm definitely not going to sleep comfortably because of all the joint pain. My sleep was probably down to maybe three good hours a night and no. it was taking a toll. Well, stick I, with, <laughs> hey, Ryan, yeah. buddy, st- stick with this for one second. A startup is hard enough as it is. Right? Yes. We have enough stress and enough stuff to deal with all day long. Stuff that's keeping us up at night. 100%. Now add persistent, chronic, physical pain <laughs> to the yeah. equation so that you're, you, you can't sleep even if you, if, if you had the opportunity. Yep. On top of that, every day you wake up, you feel worse than the day before. And that's, and right. that's before you have to deal with all the stuff we're dealing with in the formative <laughs> yeah. stages of building yep. a company. Yeah. And so y- your energy levels are, are for shit at that point. Your, what's your mental state like at that point? It's a, it's a very mixed bag um, because to, to some degree, work was a good escape, right? Like coming in and knowing we're building something that matters, we're working with good people. Like that did give me something to kind of pour my energies into that to some degree could be separated from the pain and suffering that I was going through at a, at a physical level. Um, but was I at peak performance? Not even close, right? Like very little sleep, the distraction of pain, the scratching, the itching, like all of those things, um, really start to take a toll. And then I start to wonder, is anybody else noticing this? Right. So then you add that other, that third party stress, like who else is observing the way? And, and I knew they were right. Cause people were constantly asking, you know, you okay. How are you feeling? How, how's it today? Um, and I did some extreme, like, you remember when I shaved my head yeah, for the first time and I walk into the office and everybody's like, holy shit, (laughs) (laughs) who's that? And then I don't remember who it was, but then like somehow they hadn't picked up on the whole reason behind this, like, which was to get a little more sun on my head and to remove some of the, you know, like the, the obstruction to removing the scaling and all that stuff. Somebody was like, Hey, your head's really red. Are you okay? I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> literally across our entire open office structure. Somebody shouted that at me and I was like, yeah, not so much. Yeah. This wasn't a, this wasn't a style move. I didn't do this because I thought it looked really cool with a shaved head. Um, so yeah. But, but so, so, so at that point though, uh, things are going horribly. Uh, yeah. startup is stressful as it is. You're, you're building a family as well. So there's all kinds of, of things there yeah, and you yeah. don't know that this is going to get better. Well, I'm told that it won't. I'm told that it will get worse. Oh, shit. Okay. Right? And I'm so, told that this continues to go that direction. How are you processing it? In other words, you know, how are you forecasting Ryan's future at 36 years old with chronic pain uh, trying to build a startup? <laughs> well, look, luckily, having been through startups before, I'm that kind of optimist. I'm the kind that can be told it's not going to work. It's going to get worse. This, this can't happen. This, this is going to fail. And I'm still just dumb enough to keep trying, right? I think that's that's a tenant of a startup <laughs> founder, right? So I applied right? yeah. I applied the exact same approach to to my my condition. I said, you know what? 
uh, I don't believe you. I think I can find a solution. I'll make this better. I can do it better. I can think about it more than you can. I can be better at this than you are. Um, and so I just set out to do psoriasis better than anybody else could. All right. Um, and, uh, it's, it's not proved to be a hundred percent successful, but I'm managing. All right. But so at that point, right at that point, it, it was, it was starting to get more serious. The introduction of the, of the joint pain and all that, that really felt like it was going to change life in ways that I couldn't just work around, right? Like the skin right. issue, if I'm okay with it and it causes people to stare at me or something like that, okay, all right, fine, no big deal. I can process that, I can deal with that. If I can't get up and down off the floor, if I can't get out of bed, if I can't get out of an office chair, I can't walk to grab a coffee from the kitchen, that's a problem, right? And, yeah. and, and that's one where if that continues to get worse, I'm thinking like, am I gonna be, you know, anyway, I'm not thinking wheelchair level, but like, at some point, am I going to be like that? Am I going to need help with motility? Like, and that at 36, yeah. that's not, that's not something you want to be thinking about. Absolutely. Right. And so that was really where, um, I, I started to say like, look, we're doing a lot of things. Um, what else can we do? Are there other extreme moves that we can make? Um, and you know, that's when, that's when we started to have the conversation. I'm like, well, you know, you asked me specifically, like, well, what has ever made this better? And, and I said, you know, there was the, the period that I lived in Cyprus, I had warm weather, sun, salt water all year round. Right. And, and, and yes, those are also the ingredients of a, of a typical vacation. But <laughs> in my case, it just, it just so happens those things do also, also impact, uh, the condition, right? The, the sure. cold, long, dry winters of Ohio made everything worse every year sure. compounding getting worse getting worse not recovering as much across the summer which is what i was used to i was used to a period of like really bad inflammation really bad skin issues and then everything would kind of get better right the, the, the spring would would bloom and i would feel good again and it didn't happen that year right 2015 it didn't happen spring came summer came we're heading into fall i feel as bad as i did at the worst part of winter and i'm staring at another winter coming in a couple months and I think that was what broke me. I think that was the point where I was like, I said to my wife, I was like, I, I can't do this. I can't face another winter having not improved at all, knowing that the trajectory is downhill and it's going to get worse this winter. I got to do something. Like I It was hard to watch you too, can't right? And, and I, I just mean like to watch a friend of mine in pain like that, uh, yeah. it was, it was brutal to, to watch you get worse and worse. I mean, in, in knowing that there wasn't, you know, a, at the time, not thinking that there was a solution in sight. That was, that was tough yeah. to watch, man. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate the empathy and I, it, it, it was hard to go through. Right. And the other, the other challenges, and this is the one where it's like, yes, it's chronic. Yes, it's bad. Um, there's no cure for it. And yet I always knew somebody that had something worse. Right. And so just that aspect, it was like, there was always this nagging voice in the back of my head saying, you know, just suck it up, man. Don't let this bother you that much. This could be a lot worse. And so therefore you shouldn't let this bother you that much. And that itself drove stress. Right? Just yeah, like yeah, not even course. allowing myself to feel bad about it. Right. No. Is it as bad as it could be? No. Was it bad? Yes. Was it bad enough to be worried about? Yes. Did I give myself the space to do that? No. <laughs> right. Because just power through it, muscle through, just do what you got to do and it'll be okay. All right. But so this is the point where, you know, I sat down with you and Elliot in the conference room and said, guys, um, it's broken. Like I've got to change something fundamentally. And that was when we started to talk about what if we play test me not being in the office, me not being in Ohio and, and me going to a very much or all remote position. And while, you know, technically possible and, and I had, I had your buy-in, I had Elliot's buy-in, you know, we were, you guys were very, very kind and, and understanding about that situation. There was still a lot of doubt in my mind as to whether that would work. We were at a critical point in building the business. If you recall, oh, we had I recall. just acquired, <laughs> we, we had just acquired Zirtual, right? Yeah. We had just gone through. And I think that was another, I mean, that was a very stressful situation. You know, the way we went through that acquisition, the, the timing, uh, the, the lack of time, you know, the urgency around the way that happened. 
And, um, and and that was what our fourth, fifth acquisition. We were yeah. buying companies every six months. So if yeah. you've ever gone through an acquisition on either side of it, you'll know it's it's a hellacious process. Doing a whole bunch of them stacked on top of each other, not awesome. Um, so yeah. to your point, Ryan, stressful as hell. Did not help my condition at all. Right? <laughs> no, In fact, I think no. it was it, it was probably one of the, it wasn't the last straw, but it was one of the last straws that really got me to that point where I felt that breaking point. And you know, so... It, Ryan, it, it puts you at a point where you will, you'll do whatever it takes to make the pain go away. Yeah, that, uh, that was where I was because I could see I was, I was waiting for more, right? And it was that anticipation of, of the worsening condition that really got me, right? Like physically, I was still at a point where I could handle it. Mentally, I just, I, I tapped out. I said, like, I just, I cannot imagine being here in January and being okay. Like I, I felt like if it's already getting to me, just anticipating it when the reality hits, it's, it's going to be bad. Right. And so, you know, we, we had the conversation, we, we, we worked out a way to test it and say like, well, let's, let's try it. Let's, let's, I'm going to take my family. I'm going to move to Florida. I'm going to be one flight, but you know, I'm, I'm at least, you know, a day away, um, same time zone and all that, but I'm not going to be in the office. And at that point, that was a more significant issue because we had, we were doing work from home Wednesdays, but that we was weren't it. that and remote as a company. We point. were not, we were yeah. not, I would say, oh my gosh. I mean, at that point, two or Zirtual three changed people. that a bit. Yeah. Two or three yeah. remote people, if you don't account for Zirtual, which was so brand new that it didn't feel integrated yet. And so right, yeah, right, there were right. two or three remote people. Um, and, and a couple of those had always been remote. And we're always contractors and, you know, they were an integral part of the team, but we had never had them in the office. So we had built a relationship sure. with them that way. And so I'm going through and saying, you know, like, how is this going to work? Fundamentally, how are we going to make this work? And I think this is the other major challenge when you're suffering from something like this in a startup, the startup certainly contributes to the issues, right? The, sure. the stress was there. You know, the fact that you can't just take time whenever you need it, um, that there are expectations on your time, on your performance, that you desperately, holistically want it to work, right? You are pouring yourself into this and you just have less and less of yourself to pour. It makes it harder to keep up on the startup side, which contributes to the stress and anxiety and pain. And you have less and less energy to actually deal with the problem. And so there's just this horrible cyclone uh, of self-perpetuating uh, problem, right? And so figuring out ways to, to isolate those things and actually get in a position where you can make yourself better, I would say is infinitely harder, right? You know, if you're, yeah, like absolutely. you said, if you're working in a company, you can take time off or you could quit. You could, you know, you could stop for a while, right? And come back, get a job somewhere else. It is not the same thing, right? And you don't, and this is the difference. You don't feel trapped by it. I didn't feel trapped at all. I felt so compelled to keep doing what I was doing that I couldn't imagine not doing it. Sure. The thought of not doing it was more painful than the continuation of doing it with pain. Of course. Right? And that's powerful, right? And, and that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing on one hand, right? It does not help you solve your problem, but... It shows the level of connectivity, the level of care, the level of, of, of passion that we put into these things, right? And this isn't, this isn't me, you know, saying like, you must suffer in order to be successful at startup, right? No, not that. <laughs> right? Yeah, right, right. Absolutely. I not. hope nobody suffers, right? But if you do, um, you know, it, it, it can be hard to separate those things. Um, and so we went through the physical separation in the office, right? I moved to Florida, moved my family who had just kind of started to settle, right? We were two kids in at this point. Um, I had just imported an in-law, uh, from overseas to stay with us, you bought a house, uh, my, sold a, bought house, a house, house, sold a house, bought a house. My, my, uh, father-in-law, uh, had just arrived, uh, two weeks prior to us making the decision. So, you know, his plan was to come uh, and live with us in Ohio. And now we're like, Hey, welcome, uh, welcome to Ohio, Baba. Uh, by the way, um, uh, we're, we're packing up to leave starting tomorrow. <laughs> right? So a <laughs> lot going on. Um, and then we had to, we had 10 days in Florida that we'd already booked for a vacation that we then turned into the move to figure out what to do, where to stay, where to live, right? Where to plant our family, um, a decision that we were not, had not spent a lot of time, uh, or, or effort, you know, thinking about. So we had 10 days. So 
dial up the stress again, right? And and so things definitely got worse uh, before they got better uh, significantly. Uh, in, in fact, because there was the psychological impact of being away from my friends, my family, my company, um, all of that compounded. Um, and you know, the stress of the move, all of those things, um, you know, it was tough for the kids. Um, you know, they had started to develop their little friendships. My eldest was already in school. There was a lot going on. Um, but there is a bit of a rainbow at the end of the story so that it doesn't all, all sound awful, you know, with support from, from you, Elliot and the rest of the team, um, I was able to quickly fall into a great work rhythm, right? It took a couple of weeks and I found my stride. We had a couple of hiccups early on. Uh, you know, I, I needed to figure out how to dial up communication, um, while also solving, you know, my, my, my own personal issues, trying to, to work through those at the same time as trying to develop a new pattern of work. It wasn't easy. Uh, you guys made it easier uh, and I am forever grateful for that. Sure. And, you know, eventually, uh, things, things started to improve, right? I was getting out every morning on the beach and, and, you know, <laughs> early before work, getting some sun, getting some salt water, body started to feel better. Um, and the other thing was just not being in the office where I had to put on a face, try not to grimace, try not to let the condition show. I didn't realize how much of an impact that was having. Um, that turned out to be huge. And when I isolated myself, uh, from the office and I no longer had to put on the game face, um, it became a lot easier. I could just be me. I could just have pain. Um, I could suffer when I needed to, I could feel good when I needed to. And, and that made it a lot easier. And so, uh, where are you today? Like, you know, what's your day look like now versus <laughs> just a few years ago? Um, it's, pretty incredible actually this is going to sound like one of those uh, uh terrible before and after from a from a, a fad diet commercials um i am now uh running multiple times a week i'm um, i'm training jujitsu three times a week uh why am i running you ask because i hate running uh that's something uh, most people know me. i hate running i'm a dog you bounce a ball i will chase it i'm running because i've now joined a second division professional soccer team here in guatemala where i've moved my family to and I could not like, I think of, and that's, this is at 40. I think about 36 year old Ryan and what he would have been capable of, of doing. It is not this. And even the mindset wouldn't have been like, if you told me, ah, yeah, you're going to get better and you're going to be doing these specific things. I'd be like, thanks for trying to motivate me, but that's total bullshit. There's no way I'm going from this to that. Right. At that point, I was thinking, how do I just put the brakes on this condition? How do I just slow things down so that it doesn't get worse as fast as it is an hour. All I was sure. trying to do was change the velocity of, of the progression of the condition. And instead, I've, I've reversed a, a fair amount of it. It came down to diet, which was huge, access to healthy, local grown foods. I don't want to go off on a diatribe of how I fix myself. It's not what this is about. But I did have to make fundamental changes. And we worked together uh, as a family to do that. We worked together as partners to do that. Um, and you know, having that motivation of wanting to be there for my family, for the company and for myself. Right. And, and I'm now doing things that I literally would not have thought were possible. Uh, that weren't possible. I could not have done this then. I had so much pain. Like I would have, I would have just broken myself. You know, so, yeah. So life is good right be, now. The beginning and end of the story though. Uh, and I'm just going to use the, the startups.com timeline portion of it because it, you, you kind of hit the peak right in the middle, if you will, of the yeah. of your startups time and figure, you know, we've been doing this for about seven years now. And it's it, the flare ups begun, you know, around the time we were getting started. They peaked when shit really hit the fan across the whole yeah. business. <laughs> yep. Couldn't have come at a worse time. Uh, and and also seemed to have kind of 180'd around the time that the business settled down too. I'm not saying that there, there's any correlation necessarily. I'm just saying that it's a seven year arc. It's not, this yeah. isn't something that, that was a problem for a month and you knocked it out. It yeah. wasn't a bad cold, right? <laughs> no, no. This was I'd a really a, long, cold. yeah, yeah. This, this was a really, really long period where you had to go through and figure out uh, how bad it was going to get, how to deal yep. with how bad it's going to get, and then how to correct it. Um, yeah. And, and I'm so happy that you're on the other side of it. But I, I remember every bit of the entire journey. And, and I, I, the reason I say this is because for folks that are listening, that may be dealing with some, some stuff now, and it could be all kinds of life problems. It doesn't have to be just health problems. It takes time. 
You know, these, these arcs are long. You know, if, if you're just getting into the issue now, this may be something that's going to take you two or three years to resolve. Uh, not everything can get resolved right away. Ryan, what you did was you kept optimism through the whole thing and, and right. you kept looking to, to try to beat it, uh, yeah. which takes so many cycles to do. And, and for a lot of folks, they see the, the, the big life issue come up and they say, well, I guess everything is, you know, it's, it's over now. And, you know, we both dealt with points where we thought it was going to be over. Eh, not necessarily. Life's long. You know, you, you got a long time to yeah. figure these problems yeah. out. And again, I think, I think being, being in a startup is great training for that anyways, right? Like it's, it's the same, same cycle there, right? You can, you can basically look at how long is it going to take to solve this problem, right? Of starting a company. It's the same trajectory. Right? Yeah. Optimism it's, in it the face takes of time, the abyss. It takes optimism, right? <laughs> yep. It's exactly it. Well, look, man, um, we both went through stuff at the same time, right? So let's, let's, let's turn back to, to you now. Um, and you know, there were a lot of parallels, a lot of similarities, but there were, there were some, some big differences. And the biggest difference for me was that I came into this knowing what I was dealing with, ah. right? <laughs> there is that. I knew, right. I knew yeah, what it was. Yeah. There wasn't, there wasn't a question as to, to what the condition was or what the trajectory looked like, what the treatments were, anything like that. Um, when we turn to your story, it's, it's very different. Right. What did it, how, how do I have the timeline? It took all every bit of two and a half, three years just to get to the proper diagnosis. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, the TLDR on this one is three years ago, I was planning on ending my career. Uh, like I, three, three years ago, I had sat down with my wife and we were planning what would happen for me to never have a job ever again. So when things hit kind of peak awfulness <laughs> for me, <laughs> Uh, it was that bad. So I'll kind of give such you such a crazy story. conversation to have, right? It, like, it, I mean, but it was real. And, and, and it, yeah. at the time it didn't look like there were, there were any other options. So, uh, you're what, t- three years ago. So 29 at that point, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I wish <laughs> <laughs> 21, just at, at drinking age. Um, so for me, it started, uh, probably around 2007, 2008, I was living in Santa Monica at the time, and I'll never forget. I'm in the shower uh, washing my hair, and I feel like this weird tingle shoot across my head. And I didn't think much of it at the time. Uh, it could be anything. You know, sometimes you twist your neck the wrong way, and you yep. kind of get, get a whatever. Um, but then as the weeks and months went on, it kept happening. Uh, specific to whenever I was basically washing my hair, which meant I was rubbing my hands across my scalp. Uh, I went to a doctor. It, it wasn't persistent enough it wasn't painful enough to like warrant any more investigation the doctor kind of wrote it off sure didn't think much of it uh years go by and it starts getting slightly progressively worse it goes from uh you know if i were to give a a tooth uh, pain example hey that feels a little bit uncomfortable all the way to um holy shit i think somebody's putting a um a knife in my in my gums right i mean Uh, so it, 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 it escalated uh so Again, at the time, I have no idea uh, what's causing it. Uh, we start the company. Again, this is, uh, this is starting, it's starting to get worse, but it's not at peak yet. And it's getting triggered every single time I move my mouth. And if you've listened to this podcast ever, <laughs> Ryan, this is the longest <laughs> I've not talked. Your story was the longest I've <laughs> yeah, I, shut up. I think so. <laughs> yep. to let someone else talk. Yeah. There's a fair so, amount of mouth movement. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So me talking isn't, isn't an inconsistent thing. Um, but it was getting triggered uh, in my face uh, whenever I would talk or eat. So when I was moving my jaw muscles and it was getting triggered on one side of my face and what it was, was a pain that would shoot across my forehead, across kind of like below my eyes and uh, below my jaw on, on the right side of my face. Yes. And it started to get really bad. Again, at first it felt like a tingle and would then when it started to fire, as I got further into uh, this condition getting worse, it yep. started to really, really crank. And it started to happen a lot. You remember I'd be in meetings? Yes. Oh, man. Now, I, I, what's interesting, I can, I can go through the, the, the entire arc with this one as well. In the same way that you watched me devolve in, in my condition, I remember that you would call it out when it would happen early on. You'd be like, oh, I can, I can feel it again. But it went from, I can feel it again, right? Which meant that there was some sensation there. You're like, ah, it's happening. And maybe that would be like once a week you'd mention it. 
Right. Then the the frequency of how often it would happen is like, you know, at least once a day, I'd be like, oh man, this is like, oh, you'd say like, this is the third time this has happened today. And you put your hand up to your face. Yep. Right. It was a sensation. Right. Then it went into a pain where like you would, you would say like, oh, ow, you know, like you would start to call out the pain. And then it went beyond that to where you would just like seize up. Right. So for anybody listening, this isn't like, oh, ouch, you know, I bit my tongue. This was like full body arresting level pain. Your expression would change like oh, it was all so bad. Like it was brutal. You would just stop talking. And like the first couple of times it happened, I just remember like everybody kind of look at each other like you just like mid sentence, you just stop. And we were all yeah. like, okay, what happened? At some point we got used to it and like it became <laughs> a, it became a, like a, a, a gut response. Like it was a right. trigger. It's like, then one of us would be like, ah, okay. You know, and then one of us would just pick up and take on, like if it happened in a, in a, you know, in an internal meeting, it's one thing, but if, you know, we had clients in or, or we had a partner in or we're doing or a, we're a buying video companies. conference or something, buying companies, right. We're doing a lot of that. Right. And then, you know, suddenly, you know, you stop talking in the, in the middle of the, the negotiation. Um, it was a challenge, right. It was <laughs> both for you physically and, and for us as a company they're like, Okay, well, we gotta we gotta fill the silence here. We can't just not talk right now. It was super yeah, weird. It was it, it was know, brutal. I, I'd, to watch. I'd be in front of. We were doing tons of business development at the time. I was yep. in tons of meetings. Imagine you're in a meeting and you're presenting to say investors, and two slides into the deck, you you're in so much physical pain that you can't move your mouth, which means you can't yep. explain to the people in the room why you're not talking. Like they have no idea what's happening, right? And, and all of a sudden, you're in such physical pain that if you move your mouth again you'll be on the floor in tears. And, and the on the floor in tears started to happen a lot. I mean, yes. this, is the, this is the kind of pain where you can't tough it out. This is specifically the equivalent of getting tasered in the face. Um, and as it started to escalate, the pain became so excruciating and so consistent um, that like once or twice a week, I would be on the floor crying. It, it was yeah. that bad of pain. Yeah. Um, We'd find you. Yeah. You'd, you'd yeah. disappear off to the conference it, room or get yeah. out of the basement in the workout room, lay down. And I had no idea what was happening. And so I start going on this long journey, this epic journey of trying to find my medicine man <laughs> yeah. to figure out what the F is wrong with me. And I went, I went to everybody. I went from everybody from acupuncturist <laughs> yep. to dentist to see if it was a TMJ issue. Um, pain doctors, of course. Do you remember when the pain doctors started prescribing me all the pain meds? And I, I was do, sleeping. But do you? Yeah. Do you remember that period? No, I mean, seriously. I, that, was, that was a crazy time. I remember you sleeping. Were just so out of it. So out of it. I was sleeping for 16 hours a day. And not because I was tired, <laughs> but because I was on total. so much. <laughs> God. Uh, and, and do you remember it got to the point where like it was so bad I couldn't even remember words? Like I would yeah. be, I'd be yep. struggling. I, I was on so much medication. Again, guys, yeah, this is in the middle of the most critical point in our business. Ryan, yeah. you're covered in blood because you can't sleep at night. <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> we is... were the two worst startup superheroes ever. Oh Head my scratch God. and lock jaw, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. And, and, you know, we're both really optimistic people, but yeah. we're also very pragmatic. And so yes. as this thing starts to escalate, I remember uh, a couple things happen. I remember, uh, just like you were talking about with your daughter, you couldn't, you know, uh, reach down to grab her. I remember uh, my daughter Summer. I go to reach down and kiss her, and I mean, mind you, she's you know newborn, and I can't. I physically can't pull my lips together to kiss her. I'm in so much pain, right? And I'm like, uh, dude, come on, right? This is this uh, okay. So I sit down with my wife, trying not to do very much talking because I wasn't very good at it at the time, right? And and I remember telling her. You know, I was, I, was, uh, I was 37 at the time. Um, and, uh, and I remember telling her, I was like, I'm, I'm at a point in my life where everything I do is very conversational. Like, everything I do is presentation, business development. Yep. I'm very outgoing. I'm never going to be able to talk for the rest of my life. I mean, this is only getting worse. So yep. if I can't talk now, um, there's a 99% chance as the, the months and years follow, I'm never going to be able to talk again. Uh, by right. the way, eating is an issue. Like it's a whole thing. If I didn't move my mouth, it didn't hurt, right? So there was that. <laughs> but, so that left you with sleeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like I was basically going to be on um, on instant messenger for the rest of my life, trying to you know 
with all my my relationship. Um, <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how Slack was born. Yes, yeah, <laughs> specifically yeah, exactly, to solve right? Will's problem. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, so this problem is getting worse and worse. On a fluke, of all people, my GP, my doc, um, over text message as we're going back and forth in this, because I'm on so many pain medicines, I'm trying to coordinate with him all the things that are happening. He said, you know, it might be this super rare condition called trigeminal neuralgia. And I remember there's a guy, um, Kim, Travis something or other, um, that was on Joe Rogan talking about it. He has it too. Yep. Um, yep. And you know, here's a musician having it. I can't even imagine what that's like. Uh, and it's this super rare condition where your trigeminal nerve, there's one on either side of your face and it controls all the, the sensation in your face. It doesn't control the... Um, the muscles, just the sensation. So if you if you poke yourself, if you if you were to put a needle on your face or something like that, that nerve is what's firing to tell you something's there. Every now and again, one in a gazillion times, there's a little tiny um, uh, vein or something in your face that will just grow the wrong direction, just a, a micron millimeter off, yeah. and rub the outer layer of that nerve until it's rubbed raw, until every time that you move your face. It moves that that uh, that part of that part of your nerve, and it fires just like you're getting tasered in the face, and it happens all the time. And so that nerve is reserved for the absolute worst pain, right? That's the only time that that nerve should ever be telling yeah. you anything. Yeah. And now it's just sending all these false Firing signals constantly, uh, yeah, right across your face. Uh, By the way, what pain. kind of things make you make you clench your jaw? Right, like too much caffeine, stress. Uh, you know, <laughs> any of those things happening to you at that point? All of those things. Remember, uh -huh. we did a different podcast episode where I talked about at the same time within a year. That was also you guys taking me to the hospital because I thought I was having a heart attack. <laughs> uh, we, yeah, we all thought you were having a heart attack. I remember shoving you across the back seat of the car. That was a. That I was, was a in such day. bad shape. I mean, really bad shape. And, I think uh, we can summarize that period of like that that the middle part of our arc. We could summarize that it, there, we we were the three of us were starring in a documentary called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Startup. Right? Like it's <laughs> funny to me to even look back at the photos of us from that period. We oh, look like stuff. our older uncles or like uncles or cousins or something. We don't look like ourselves. We look like weird. Uh, like actually, like right now, I would say we look so much better. We're like the lifetime versions of ourselves at that point. We're like the lifetime movie actors that would play those people, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it's night and day. We were the Benjamin Buttons of ourselves, right? It was, yes, oh, it was exactly. Just terrible. We were in such horrible shape. And doing the most stressful, high-impact things that we've done, you know, in the entire span of the company. Uh, yeah. We had so many things going on, so many high-stress things. Um, you know, all the money was at stake, everything. Um, during all of that crazy shit, and, and we were able to kind of, you know, motor through it, but uh, but it was it was... I think the hardest part for me and, and Ryan, I think you probably feel the same way is it's hard to not know that there is light at the end of that tunnel, right? I mean, it's bad enough. Yeah. Startups are hard enough to deal with as it is. Yeah. But at the time, again, I'm sitting with my wife saying, Hey, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to work again. Like, I don't think I'm going to make it to the end of this year for sure. Yeah. Um, yep. And it was only a fluke that my doctor over text message just happened to have me checked out for it. And lo and behold, that's what it was. And, and Ryan, do you remember too, one of the doctors I saw thought that the issue was, was with the, the muscles in my face. So he thought the cool move would be to fire Botox across the entire side of my face so it just yeah. wouldn't move. That looks yeah. sweet. <laughs> like I've got some great <laughs> pictures of that. Right, right. Who's the talking wax figure in the corner? No, that, oh, that's, that's, God. that's oh, Will. What a yeah. disaster. Uh, and so, so I go, I go to a, a specialist he looks at what I have and he's like, oh yes, this is, that's absolutely what it is. I mean, you have every, you know, every sign for it. He said, good news. I can put you on some uh, nerve blockers. Uh, upside is uh, they're, they're going to totally make the pain go away. Downside is you're back to sleeping 16 hours a day. And yes. once again, you won't be able to remember words. And it's, it's the weirdest Anything. thing. The medicine they oh, put my goodness. destroys your ability to recall things. And so Anything. I would be trying to explain something <laughs> and I couldn't remember the word shirt. Right. I was like, oh, yeah. yeah, this morning I got on, got up and then I put on my, oh man, what's that called? And what I couldn't, it I mean, it was that, uh, bad, I know. right. Just yeah. fundamental words. I remember and, uh, copying and pasting. We, you know, we'd have these Slack chats going 
and you'd ask a question, I'd answer it. A couple minutes later, you'd ask it again. And I would literally just copy paste. In the beginning, I remember like telling you like, dude, I just, I just scroll up like five lines, you'll find it. And at some point I realized like th- how frustrating that was for you. I just started answering the questions again. I stopped yeah, you're cool about telling it. you you're super that cool I've about already it. answered this question. Well, like I, it wasn't your fault. Like there wasn't anything you could do about it. You needed the answer. Um, and it was just a matter of like, how many times will we say it before it sticks, right? It was, I was an 80-year-old uh, man time. in a 40-year-old man's body. Yeah, uh, same. So, so Doc says to me, hey, you've got trigeminal neuralgia. I go home and I Google it. Do you remember the first thing that came up when I Googled it, Ryan? <laughs> it wasn't good. It was not good at all. The suicide oh, disease. Yeah, like, that's, dude, I, what? that's what you told us. To, yeah, I know, right? Like, really? I, like, if you're going to Google any condition, that is, like, that's the absolute last thing you want yeah. to come up. Right. right. Like, <laughs> and it's historically thanks known for as planting the, suicide the seed. Disease. Oh, because the pain God. is so bad, and historically there was, there was no uh, correction for it, that people literally killed themselves uh, because uh. They, they couldn't deal with the disease. Right. Doc says to me, he says, Good news. There's two options for surgery, both of them are horrible. Right. One option is, this is so crazy. I'm not going to really get into it, but like one option is basically we stick a needle through your entire head and, and pour acid on it. That sounds horrible. But the That's, worst option is no. we cut a hole in your skull the size of like a half dollar and go in there with forceps and try to put some Teflon over it. Like, what that? Are you kidding? Like that's actually really? a, a real way. That's, we're just going to, we're just going to wrap it up. This is like, this is the surgical version of rub some dirt on it. Like, are you kidding me? Oh my me? God. What kind of Fred Flintstone surgery is yeah. that? So, <laughs> right. So, uh. So anyway, I opted for the first one and it mostly worked. Uh, you know, I've had to go in multiple times to have it done yeah. again, which is, which is no picnic, but the alternative is a thousand times worse. And, you know, now it flares up from time to time, uh, but it's a it's hundred times better than it was before. But, you know, Ryan, both of us are at that point uh, in, in the middle of these stories where there's no hope in sight. Yeah, there's a hundred percent chance that this can't keep happening, right? We can't function at this level. Yeah, it's not. We have continue. so many people. Yeah, we have so many people relying on us, right? I remember thinking at the time, uh, "Hey, we just bought these companies. I just told these people. I gave them my word that I'm going to buy yeah. the company and kind of make it something great. We hired all these people. I sat across from these people, tried to talk, and and said, "Hey, we're going to make something great. Uh, how then can I let all of these the people exit door?" pull it open and jump out of the airplane, right? <laughs> it's the worst <laughs> mic drop ever. <laughs> you can't do that. Bye. I, I you know, I, I just, I didn't know um, how I would be able to continue moving forward and making commitments in the face of knowing uh, I may never be able to see any, any of them through. You yeah. Know, physically, it's, it's no different than you know, if yeah. you had a, a cancer diagnosis or anything else like that. We're like, well, what do I do now? Right. Yeah. You know, how do I uh, how do I make future looking decisions when my future may not have a future? Right. I, I, it was changes everything. It was brutal. And so it's another type of runway. Right. It's the same. It, it, it starts to put the yeah. same kind of pressure that you get when you have a financial runway. Right. if you're a funded startup and, you know, you know, your 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 burn rate um, leaves you four or five, six months, whatever it is you start to make decisions based on thinking that's how much time you've got left to get this right. Right. And it's really no different when we were going through these things. We're thinking like, how much longer can I do this? Like for me, it was literally like January. I know in January, this is going to be that much worse and I'm going to be a basket case. I will not mentally be able, I'd already decided I couldn't handle it, which meant that it would hundred percent be true. When we got to that time, I had already figured out I wasn't gonna be able to do it. Right. And that type of run rate is, is, agonizing, terrifying. It is too. I think what worked for us, I think at its core, again, focusing on the business part of this, uh, we were all very empathetic yeah. about each other's situation. Now, that's not always the case. I'm not saying people are horrible people. I'm saying that you know, often you'll have a lot of players uh, th- th- that are part of this and not all of them yep. are necessarily sympathetic to uh, what what you have to deal no, with, and again, so, sometimes not. these life issues aren't health. Health is kind of hard not to to care about what's what's happening with somebody. Um, but think about it this way: if you've got a a life condition that could be putting you in a tough position to move forward with the business, what are the investors thinking? I mean, the, yeah. the, the investors can can feel for you, but at the end of the day, they still have to put somebody in there in order to run the company. You yep. know, and, and that's a really tough conversation to have. However, what I have found, and I and I know some folks who have gone through this. 
uh, with investors. What I've found is sitting across from the investors face to face whenever possible and trying to explain exactly where you stand, exactly what you're trying to get done, exactly how you're plotting a course moving forward is yeah. always the right move. It right? is. Uh, hiding it, always the worst move, right? Uh, that, the that hardest never part goes. of that move in this case, in my opinion, is is having that clarity yourself, right? You got to get to that point where yeah. you can actually see, like going back in time, I don't think that you could have sat down at the peak and said with any certainty, here's, here's what I'm going through and here's how it's going to work out, right? You didn't have that clarity at that point, you know, pre uh, diagnosis, you certainly didn't, you had no idea what was happening or why, or, or how much worse it would get. Once you had the diagnosis, you weren't sure, you know, you knew that the medication wasn't going to work long term, right? It was 100% right. impacting your ability to, to run the company. Oh, and I didn't at all. you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't function. And so, you know, and this is the other interesting thing, you know, we've talked about, you know, where we were empathetic and, and, you know, how we supported each other. Um, and I'm sure that there were times where you, you had the same, same questions in your mind, like, will Ryan actually be able to, to pull this off, right? Is he going to come out of the other side of this? Like, I'm willing to support him through the effort, but like at some point, if it doesn't get any better, what happens? And you have yeah. to think about those things. Same thing, you know, for me, same thing uh, for Elliot as we're watching your progression. We're going like, all right, we're supporting as much as we can. But what if he doesn't have any, what if, right? He doesn't have any certainty around what's going to happen. How can we, right? Like, so what are we going to do? And it's, and it's, you know, it's not necessarily dire straits, but like you do have to start to consider those things and, and, you know, talk about unexpected pivots, right? Like, no, yeah, we, we're going to, we're going to change a major portion of the leadership of the company over this. Like that is a huge, huge impact. Yeah. And, and I think what worked well for us was that, uh, we kind of took it, took it as it came up. Like, you know, even though things were getting worse, we were still saying, okay, well, let's, let's see where things are in a month. Let's see, you know, let's see what happens next. Yep. We didn't try to get, uh, to a point where we have to solve the whole thing now, you know, uh, Ryan has to go or Will has to go because it might be a problem in the future. Right. Again, yeah, no, no. some businesses can't afford to take that position. Um, and so yep. this isn't, you know, it does, doesn't work for everybody. Your mileage may vary. Um, but I definitely think that one of the things that helped us a lot to say, hey, this is the problem as it stands now. But like with every problem, there is a longer arc towards solving this problem. Yes. We're just at, at chapter one or two in this story. Don't think that this is the final chapter necessarily. And that's why I was pointing out that, you know, your arc to the story, my arc to the story spanned over really over a decade. Yeah. Right. And so really what I would have loved to have, to have seen, you know, if I went back in time, which I seem to love to do, uh, to go back to, to Will having this problem. And if I could have given him no other advice, I would have said, look, plan this out over two years, five years. Don't try to plan this out over six months. Right. Yeah. Because things take a long time to evolve. And you need to be able to, to plan for a longer arc than just what's happening today. If you can. Sure. And again, every situation is different. Yeah. And, and again, like we can tie that directly back to the, the same advice we'd give somebody suffering from a startup challenge, not a health challenge. It's the same thing, right? You've got to give yourself reasonable horizons to solve these problems. Because if you set the expectation that I have to solve this, I have to have this figured out within six months, that may be impossible. Right. And so then you're setting yourself up for a false negative on this business. And you're saying like, look, hey, I'm, I'm going to give it six months. If it's not solved, then, you know, we're, we're just going to we're going to bag it. And maybe that's the right choice. Maybe it's not. Again, mileage will vary and the situations are, are all very different dynamic. Um, but you've got to be reasonable with yourself and with the company, with the staff, with everybody involved, the investors in setting reasonable horizons for accomplishing these things. And uh, particularly, again, just like with the health conditions, the startup, they're both operating under terms of relative uncertainty. And I therefore, think, you've got to have that space to let things come into focus. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the longer you give yourself, the more you can do about anything. I think in startup world, we're so used to doing things so quickly, right? We're so used to making fast decisions, raising money quickly, doing everything quickly. This is one of those times where <laughs> doing things quickly isn't necessarily your friend, right? Not at all. Not at all. Right. Yeah. I think it, 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 I think you won't find the time and space to solve the problems adequately. And you're also going to add a ton of mental stress by putting an arbitrary short timer on these things 
uh, that make you feel more pressure than you should in trying to solve them. I agree. That's a wrap for this episode of the Startup Therapy Podcast. This is Ryan Rutan on behalf of my partner, Will Schroeder, and all the Startups.com family thanking you for joining us. And we hope you'll continue to join us. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and comment on iTunes or wherever you love to listen to Startup Therapy. You can find all of our episodes at startups.com slash podcast. If you're looking for more amazing resources to launch or grow your startup, be sure to head to startups.com and check out Startups Unlimited. It's everything we have to offer from our online university to our amazing community of experts and founders, and even all the tools we've built like BizPlan, Fundable, and LaunchRock. It's everything a founder needs. Visit startups.com slash begin. That's startups.com slash B-E-G-I-N. You'll thank me later. Thank you.